people with severe learning disabilities sometimes use challenging behaviour as a method of communication. This film looks at how their families and support workers can develop the skills both to deal with it and, more importantly, find strategies to prevent challenging behaviour occurring. Many people, with, especially with severe learning disabilities, um, don't have good communication. They've not learned either to express themselves very clearly or to understand what other people are saying to them. And if they then can't say to us, back off a minute, give me a break, they might cast around for a way which works, um, a way that they can use which stops us doing what we're doing. And that way might be hitting us or screaming at us. What we think happens in most cases is that these things develop almost accidentally in childhood. But people respond to them. And so they work. And people use them over and over and over again. Jan knows all about challenging behaviour. Her fourth child, Andrew, suffered brain damage during his traumatic birth. Andrew was asphyxiated at birth um, and the first night of his life he fitted um, consistently and they found it difficult to control the seizures. So the outlook looked pretty bleak. But I was told that they wouldn't know the extent of any damage if there were any damage. It was development that was got his development that would actually identify what his difficulties might be. As Andrew grew, Jan began what would become a regular pattern of adapting her behaviour, routine and home to accommodate his changing needs. Initially it was just hair pulling and curtain pulling. Um, and as he got older, and with the changes in terms of his support and I guess a lack of consistency in the way he was supported, he started to become destructive and disruptive as well. So he didn't just pull curtains down and pull hair anymore, he actually destroyed rooms, he, he swept everything through things, broke things. And quite big things, it can be something as big as a microwave that he might throw if he's in the kitchen. The new skills he was learning with more difficult behaviours got responses, so it was effective. Hair pulling obviously didn't work as well, whereas throwing something had a better impact and got the response maybe that he needed. As Andrew reached adulthood, Jan decided the best way to safeguard his future was to take control. Using direct payments, she recruits, trains and manages his entire team. She has studied Andrew's triggers and, over time, has developed a guide which outlines the style of life that suits him best. This is Andrew's essential lifestyle plan. It tells us what makes Andrew happy, it tells us what makes him upset, and it tells us what his important routines are. It's a living document. It helps Andrew by providing good information to the people that support him. Information that he's not able to share himself because he's not able to talk. And he doesn't necessarily... Well, I guess he does know what makes a good day because he's going to be happy. But if you've not seen him have a good day, how are you going to know what makes a good day? There has to be a way of, of, of uh, recording all of that rich um, knowledge and experience, and, and that's what this plan is. We're going to Taylor's for tea, aren't we? Andrew's brother, Gary, helps out whenever he can. If we ever get up to the chemist and back in time, <laughs> if... <laughs> yeah. On the whole, if Andrew's lifestyle is implemented and he's well supported and has a busy active life, not allowing him to be bored, not allowing him to become hungry, not allowing him to be overstimulated is just as bad as being bored, um, on the whole it works. Andrew now lives in his own home, in the village where he grew up. Behave yourself for five minutes. Say <laughs> no, I just, I'm being silly. Support worker Phil joined the team a month ago. You're going to blow the oven? Again. And what's in there? I think it's important for Andy is, is, is sticking to, to his routine. Any, any sort of um, sidestepping away from it can lead to, uh, lead to anxiety and uh, can upset, upset him. So everything is quite, uh, quite rigid. There's, there's three activities a day. Um, they're all started at pretty much the same time, finish at the, at, at the same time every day. Every Friday, Andrew eats out at a local Chinese restaurant where he has his own menu to choose from. What would you like today, Andrew? 
sweet salmon. Thanks to Jan and the other members of Andrew's team, his lifestyle is busy and his challenging behaviour usually manageable. Yes, a bus. Looking back, Jan can see where she could have been better supported. Children with complex needs are nearly always the ones that are excluded from respite care. So the families that have the most difficulty get the least support. Parents don't get any training. P parents just learn by experience. I learned very soon that when Andrew threw one of his most uh, treasured DVDs and it ended up in the washing up bowl and he still wanted it to work, I, I quickly learned that he didn't understand consequences. But it's learning on the job and it would have been so much better if that learning, that understanding had happened from the time I needed it to happen, from when he was very small. Families need, broadly speaking, two things. First of all, they need practical support and um, there's plenty of evidence that families often don't get the practical support they need. That support needs to be 24-7. Um, it's no good uh, providing support to families that's only available in office hours. Practical, not, not just advice over a telephone, but the ability to be able to send a couple of people to help out um, if someone is smashing up the home or whatever. The second thing that uh, families need is they need access to short breaks. Um, of course people need uh, the opportunity to take a break uh, from what is often a very demanding uh, task. But for these people, often their son or daughter is excluded from the short break services that do exist. So people are told, well, we, we do have a short break service, but you can't have it because your son or daughter is so difficult to support that it would raise health and safety issues for us. That's outrageous. For families, there are really three things that you need to do. First of all, you need to help the family members um, to provide the support they provide in a way that reduces the likelihood of the problem arising and helps people move on from needing to use their challenging behaviour. The second thing that should be happening is they should be getting that practical help and the people providing that help need to be working in the same way. Uh, it's no good putting unskilled, untrained domiciliary care staff into this sort of situation because they could easily make things worse. And then the third thing that the family need are they need constant access to the, um, the specialists in the community learning disability team and in many places there will be a specialist team focused on challenging behaviour. And those people are important to the family because they're going to be the people who can help review what's going on, advise people about how things are, are, are going um, and adapt and develop um, the method uh, of supporting the individual. As people with learning disabilities grow older, like most people, they prefer to live as independently as possible. The best outcome for people whose behaviour presents a challenge is that they are able to live the kind of rich and varied life that we would want for anybody without needing to use their challenging behaviour. And that's got implications for staff training, uh, for leadership, because what's required is a service model that's entirely personalised. Um, in which we stop thinking about looking after groups of people uh, and just focus on each individual uh, and designing arrangements around that individual uh, that will best support them. That personalised approach has worked for 24-year-old Stephen, here enjoying one of his favourite outings. Stephen was raised by his grandparents, but when his grandmother died, he moved into a long-stay hospital. When the hospital was going to be closing, we looked at accommodation for Stephen that would meet his needs. It was identified that it would probably be best within his own environment, so he wasn't challenging to anybody else. So um, we did find an accommodation and a, and a support team that have been working with Stephen amazingly well and done some amazing things with Stephen. Um, and obviously he's progressed really well since he's moved out of the Longstay Hospital. Stephen now lives in his own bungalow, with three-to-one care at all times. It's expensive, particularly at a time of budget cuts. But it's been shown to improve outcomes for Stephen, whereas other approaches haven't. Stephen 
obviously has very profound learning disabilities coupled with autism. Obviously he can't communicate his frustrations with us so he generally to, to express himself will show quite aggressive tendencies um, but that life we've, we've tried to change that that isn't who Stephen is. Stephen is a person first and foremost. The team around Stephen has worked hard to identify the triggers for his behaviour and to ensure his life is filled, where possible, with the things he likes to do. Would you like to go out to the park? But Stephen doesn't like to interact on a three-to-one basis. What he likes to do is one-to-one. -one. So staff are always aware where the other staff member is and we take part in one-to-one -one activities all day with him if he chooses to. Sometimes he can clearly tell you he doesn't want you there um, and he can clearly tell you he wants his own company and that's fine, we respect that for a period of time but we don't let him socialise himself for any periods of time without going and knocking and saying, are you OK? <coughs> I'm going to see the pigs. <laughs> but his life is a roller coaster. his behaviour can go all over the place in one day. We can have him very happy in the morning. Um, in a split second he can be crying, in a split second he can become self-injurious or he can be happy and then he'll have a, he'll have a violent outburst. So it, it's the not knowing where he's going but what we try to do is see like Stephen's life, it, it is a roller coaster, and we're just there to hold his hand all the time. Without the support and the dedicated team that Stephen's got around him, um, I think his life would go back to being an existence where he would socially isolate himself. I could just see it would be a very quick um, sort of spiral back to where he was before. It would be very much him just being by himself and that's how he feels safe. He, he can manage like that but he shouldn't have to manage like that. He should be able to come and deem, like, take comfort from others and that's what he does with his staff team. Would you like to go to McDonald's for some dinner? Hmm? 25 to 1. 25 to 1? That'd be lunchtime, wouldn't it? Is that what you're telling us? Dinner time! <laughs> These are people who, because of the severity of their disability and the nature of their problems, they're going to be in receipt of social care services all of their lives. So we should never turn away from them and stop paying attention uh, to what they need and whether it's consistently being provided at a good enough quality. That's what I'd like to see for people whose behaviour presents a challenge. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs>